being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Father, again, we do thank you for the blessing of your word. God, we honor you this morning with our presence, with our thoughts, with our words, with our singing, with our clapping, everything that we are, Lord God, we give to you. We give you our lives this morning. You have given us so much. God, you've given us more than we could ever deserve, more than, than our full share. And so we give you our lives this morning. We dedicate them, we consecrate them to you. Beginning now, in our hearts and in our minds, we turn it over to you. In fact, we set aside, we sanctify this moment of time to you, to hear from you, that you would direct us in your word by your spirit. Again, Lord, bless your word. Teach your word and edify your people. It's in the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. Paul lays out for Christians here in this segment of, of Scripture both general instructions as well as specific instructions regarding our relationships, our family life, our work life, um, all that are following the theme of submission. Oftentimes we, we focus on, on verse 22, wives submit. Whenever folks talk about the fifth chapter of Ephesians, Many of our minds go directly to that verse. Wives, submit. I promise I will only say that a couple of more times. However, Paul sets out for us, and for us to understand that this submission, this subjection, is intended for the entire body, the entire body to submit itself one to the other. Uh, this is contrary, quite frankly, to the culture uh, that we live in. You know, we live in a culture that believes in the freedom to do your own thing. Uh, 
the liberation. Uh, this culture is concerned about self and, and self only. You can see it in everything that goes on around us. Uh, it is a feel good, do it the way you want to do it, no matter how it affects or impacts anybody else. Kids uh, no longer have, and not all kids, but many kids no longer have a, a healthy respect and fear uh, of, of elders and, and older people, not even for authority. Um, any day you could drive down the street and, and kids will, you've seen it, they will just walk in front of the car, hit me. I dare you to hit me. You know, no, no respect for authority. They, teachers will, will say to them, sit down and listen and learn. And, and so I think we're paying teachers today to be police rather than teachers. Um, you can see the lack of uh, respect and authority within the marriage. Uh, there are as many divorces in Christian marriages as there are in, in the world, the secular world. Uh, the workplace, you know, Christians go to work and if you go into an office or into a, a factory or uh, a place of service, you find it hard to pick out and to know the Christians in that workplace. So Paul lays out for us here a, a contrasting picture for believers. Uh, we are charged to be uh, the light in the world. And so I submit to you this morning that this theme of submission falls into, um, or is framed, I should say, by, by three words. Or three concepts. One of them is control. You know, who, who controls, what controls the mind, the spirit? Um, this issue of order, we see it in, in this theme of submission. And we also see the word acceptableness. So we're going to look at those three words along with a closer look at some of the specifics of these three categories, these three parts of the family uh, that Paul is, is looking at. Remembering that um, when you talk about wives and husbands, we're talking about submission. When we're talking about children and parents, we're talking about submission. And when we're talking about slaves and masters or workers and employees, we're talking about submission. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, uh, the issue of control. Paul really lays out for us that we can't submit unless we are under the correct control. See, we will never submit to the other unless there is a controlling force within us. And so he says in verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And if you are filled with the Spirit, he goes on to say, you're able then to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. First, we have to recognize that we have the Holy Spirit. If you are sitting here today and, and you are a believer, you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the presence of Christ living in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. And so there should be no question as to whether or not you you possess the power. The question then becomes, possessing the power, what do we do with it? Well, the next thing to do is to recognize how Paul is presenting this. He is not presenting this as a, a request 
or a suggestion. It is in the imperative mood. It is a command. Do it. No questions asked. You have the spirit. You are possessed by the spirit. You, you, are, you belong to God. And so allow the spirit then to fill you. It is a command. It is not only a command, but it is an ongoing process. So it happened at a point in time, and the point in time is when we got saved, and that filling should continue throughout eternity. There should not be a time when we are not filled by the Spirit of God. Now, it is also in the passive voice, which means there is a decision. Last week, we talked about the brain and, and all of the decisions that we make. You see, we could having the spirit of Christ in us, because God created us the way he did, we can say no to the Holy Spirit. In fact, that's how we sin, is we say no to the spirit. But if we submit to the spirit of God, then God is the one who then fills us and empowers us to carry out his will. You might think of um, a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you've got uh, a Christian who is defeated in their life. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got a Christian who is complacent in their life. And all along the spectrum, you have people, Christians, believers, who in varying degrees yield or don't yield to the Spirit. God is saying today is that we have an opportunity by simply yielding to the Spirit to be victorious in our life. There's no need to be defeated. There's no need to be complacent because we have God living within us. So imagine uh, you put on a glove in the wintertime and that glove receives your hand. That glove receives the power, the Everything that your hand can do, that glove will now be able to do. You took your clothes off a hanger or out of the drawer this morning and put them on. Before you put those clothes on, they're just laying there, no life, nothing going on. And now you put those clothes on, and those clothes become empowered by the body that resides in them. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Imagine getting into a plane and the, the pilot saying to you, you take over. Right. We're in trouble. If I have to fly the plane, I'm in trouble. Know nothing about flying a plane. But the pilot does. And so going through life without the Holy Spirit in control is like being in a plane and trying to fly it and not knowing what you do. You don't know whether, how to take off, how to land, how to go right, how to go left. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit as the pilot are we able to live life the way God wants us to. Control. Who is in control of your life? Now, he wants to be. He resides there. He lives there. And, 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 and as I was panning the room, I, I looked over at, at Tyrone, and I remember um, one of the messages a few months back, uh, we were talking about aspirational language. And, and, and this is certainly aspirational language language because when we talk about always being under the control of the Holy Spirit is something that we aspire to certainly we fall short but we don't have to we have 24 hours in a day how many hours of the day are you in control versus how many hours of the day is the Holy Spirit in control so if you look at the 24 hours and you say, okay, eight, I'm asleep. 
Well, you're safe if you're sleeping in the right place. So make sure you go to bed in the right place. So you got those eight, you're safe. Now the other, um, what is, what's eight from 24? 16. So you got 16 hours that you are awake. Who's in control for 16 hours of your life in that day? I submit to you that if you look back at that day before you go to bed at night and you count the hours, most of those hours are going to be in the hands of Michael or Carolyn or, or Blanche. Or, you're not going to give those to the, Why not? Why would we fly the plane when we don't know what we're doing? Give it over to the Lord. Submit. It's hard. <laughs> Giving up control. We, we are control free. We want to manage everything ourselves. Decisions. Who is going to be in control? Now, if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you really don't have to worry about who's in control. Satan is in control of your life. And you have given it over to him. You are his puppet. You are his, his, his flunky. You are his slave. You are a slave to sin and on your way to hell if God is not in your life. So you have a choice. You either become a slave of the Lord, which is freedom, or a slave of Satan, which is bondage. I choose the Lord. What do you choose? The next point. In submission, there is order. There is uh, an, an organized system that God has designed and laid out. There is order, or should be order in life. And an order of authority. You see, we get, we get hung up on the word submit because it sounds bad. You mean I have to give up my own thinking? I have to give up my own decisions? I, I, to who? To what? Why? It's, it's just nature for us not to want to humble ourselves. So authority, this order is exemplified in, in creation. Man was created by God. Man was given authority and dominion over the creation by God. He was given authority over his wife. The authority and order was dictated, designed by God himself. So if you have a problem with authority, don't come to me. I'm only doing what God told me to do. We see the order in the definition of the word. The word there, subject or submission, is the word hypostasis, staso. It is a, a military term for lining up, having the troops line up in order to go into battle. And, and they willingly, these men and women, they willingly submit themselves under the authority and leadership of, of their uh, platoon leader or their sergeant or their lieutenant, their captain, their general. They willingly do it because they've been trained. They know that if they are out of order, somebody's going to die. If everybody doesn't do what the leader says do, we subject ourselves to risk. It doesn't mean that each of those men and women are diminished in their importance because everybody in the troop, everybody in, in the platoon is important. You can't complete the task without them. But it recognizes leadership and authority. We see order and authority in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now certainly, if the Godhead 
can align itself in an order of authority, certainly we who he created can do that. The son does not try to do what the father is supposed to do. The Holy Spirit doesn't usurp authority over the son. They all line up under the authority and leadership of God the Father, willingly submitting themselves, each of them, fully God, completely God, but yet recognizing their role within the Godhead. I was, uh, this week, Carolyn and I um, went to Ocean City for um, a convention for my job. And God blessed us with a, um, a hotel room on, on the ocean. And got up in the morning to see the sunrise. The heavens clearly declare the glory of God. And you can see in every aspect of his creation order. Because if it was out of order, we'd be in trouble. The sun, every 24 hours, comes up and goes down. Order. The, the moon reflects the light of the sun to give us light during the night. I was sitting there on the balcony, looking out over the ocean, and and at some point, the horizon, it ends. And you can see how people thought at one time the earth was flat. Because it looks flat. Where does it go? But we know, because of science and, and the explorers, that the earth is round. And so think in your mind now, you got the water, which is sitting there, and it goes nowhere. Where, it just, God holds it in place. There's order in his creation. Not only that, but the waves roll up and then they go back. They roll up and then they go back. That's order. You see, if there was not order and authority, they would just keep rolling and we'd be washed out. I am so glad that he's in charge. He has ordered it so that it works perfectly. Nothing out of place. Imagine, in fact, in I think it was Pittsburgh or, or Chicago, it rained, just a little bit of rain. And, and, and the, the, the systems got clogged up and couldn't handle the rain. The water swelled into the street nine feet deep and people lost their lives. When things go wrong, we get messed up. Order. Submit. Subject yourselves to one another. Because it's the right thing to do. If we, if we get out of order, we're going to mess things up. acceptableness. This word shows up in both the King James and the New American Standard, acceptableness. It is the word euarstus, meaning well-pleasing. Look at verse 17, uh, yeah, 17 in chapter 5. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Mm. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Before the word understand comes the word but. So you can understand what the will of the Lord is, which means seek out his will, or you can be a fool. Paul does not give any room for wiggle there. You know, you, you either understand the will of God or be a fool. Do you all see any other options? 
No, it, it, it. So do not be a fool, but understand what the will of God is. Why? Why do we need to understand the will of God? Well, turn over to Romans, 12th chapter. Some might ask, well, well, God gave us a free will. Hmm, yeah, he did. And so I'm going to exercise my free will, and, and I'm going to make my own decisions. I'm going to be in control. And if that's the case, then you're going to have and live a, a really tough life. We see that today in, in our kids. Frankly, we see that today in adults. I, I, I'm going to live the way I want to live. I have a free will. God gave me a free will. But he wants us to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit that he might direct us. Look at chapter 12, and I'm going to start at 1 and, and read through 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, even though you have a free will, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. This word acceptable there means well pleasing. You see, when we do the will of God, God is pleased. So, what is the corollary to that? Now, you may remember in geometry, when you, I think geometry was in middle school or high school, geometry, there was a, the word corollary meant the opposite. What is the opposite of pleasing God. Well, the opposite of pleasing God is not pleasing him. The, God doesn't give us a whole lot of options. You know, we don't get to choose. Uh, sometimes um, I'm at home. Um, in fact, it was this week. And, and Carolyn turned on uh, Let's Make a Deal. And in Let's Make a Deal, there are usually all of these options. Choose door one, door two, door three, and then after you choose one of them doors, he comes up with some more options. Well, do you want this envelope or that envelope? God does not do that. You either accept me or you don't. Amen. Pleasing God is why we want to do his will. He created us. He redeemed us. And so we should want to please him. Turn over to Colossians the first chapter. Look at verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled, there's that word filled, with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all, asp in all respects bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God so Paul is saying there I heard about your faith and because of that we continue to pray for you so that you so that so that you be controlled by the knowledge of his will and see once you're controlled by the knowledge of his will you're now seeking and gaining wisdom and understanding so that you're able to walk in a manner that is worthy of him and that pleases him in all respects now look at the last part of this bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God Carolyn and I were sitting on the balcony and, 
And you know, we were talking about the flatness of, of the earth. Well, it's not flat, it's round. Think about all of the other bodies in his universe. They're all round. God has a thing for roundness, for, for circular. In fact, I heard a David uh, preach a wedding, and he talked about the, the, the fact that the ring that goes on your finger is round and symbolizes eternity. Well, look at this verse. It says, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So Paul is saying is as you increase in the knowledge of God, you, you continue to gain knowledge and please him. You increase in the knowledge of God. You continue to increase. You please him. And it just keeps going around in a, in a circular motion. Eternally, we, the more we gain, the more we, we accept, the more that we submit to God, the more knowledge we gain, the more we please him. Submission is not about us. It's about pleasing God. Christ said it himself, about to go to the cross. And he said, let this cup pass. No, rather, not my will, but thy will be done. He also said, and this is amazing, everything I do pleases God the Father. Everything. Think about your life. Just think about the last four or five hours since you got up. Has everything that we have done been pleasing to the Lord? I, Carolyn and I were away this week, as I said, and we were, we prayed before we left. We prayed during the time, I mean, we, we prayed. And, and we, our hope was that we wouldn't mess up the week by getting on each other's nerves or doing something that was, you know, it, you know, that we would just be in a fussing and fighting. So no matter how much we prayed and wanted that, stuff still happened. I, my, my goal was to please her. My goal, but I messed up. You know, said something wrong here or, you know, it's easy for us to mess up just by living and breathing. So we need to intentionally, intentionally want to please God. Because if you don't, I can tell you, you're going to mess up. You reduce the risk if there is intention to please him. Christ is... Christ had the intention when he left heaven to please God. It was in his heart and his mind, I'm going to please the Father. I'm going to go through with the plan. Acceptableness. Well-pleasing to, to the Lord. Submission. Subjection. To one another. To each other. Pleases God. Can you imagine the smile, the joy that God experiences when his people that he created and redeemed do things that please him all the time. The, the, the enemy is before God. We know that because it says it in Job. He walks to and fro through the earth seeking who he may devour. And so he is standing, he's probably standing right before God right now. Lord, Michael, he might be preaching right now, but give him three hours. He is going to do something to make you mad. Watch, I'm telling you. But then God can say, but look at him now. He's preaching the word. Because <laughs> see, three hours from now, I may not be here. We don't know what the next moment holds. Please him today, a moment at a time. 
there are three paragraphs here that, that Paul uses to crystallize our understanding. See, it's one thing to, to look at this in a general nature, you know, the body. I, I, I can be nice to, to Moses because I only see him three hours a week. I can do that for three hours. Anybody can be nice to Moses for three hours, right? But see, then Paul says, let, let, that's the big family. Let's go to the smaller family unit and see what you do. Mm. So why didn't he start with our work situation first? After all, we only see those folks, what, eight hours? Of, you know. But he started with the, nu the, the, the nuclear, the nucleus, thank you, the nucleus of the family, the wives and the husbands. One thing that we need to understand about these paragraphs before I go there specific is they, they have similar structure. First, Paul presents in each of these paragraphs the, the person who is to submit first. Wives, be subject. Children, be obedient. Slaves, workers, be obedient. Okay, so that's the first thing to recognize. The second thing to recognize is that the person who has the authority, make no mistake about it, the wife, the child, the worker, the slave, is submitting to the person who has authority over them. Now remember, this is given to, from God. This is not anything that this person has on their own. This authority comes from God. But, but you, what you have to look at is there, is even though they are being submitted to, they have a requirement themselves. Each of them has a requirement. Husbands, love your wives. Parents, do not provoke. Masters, do not threaten. Then, it's implicit in all of them, and in these instructions, that the authority is not unlimited. In other words, I'm the husband, my wife submits to me, but I don't have unlimited authority over her. You see, I cannot tell her to, honey, like I used to, honey, Way long, long, long time ago, not, not yesterday or last week. This is a long, long time ago. Honey, let's go smoke some weed. You see, I can't, I don't have the authority to make her do something that God says is wrong. My authority is limited to what God approves in his will. So, so, Wives, children, and employees, it's okay to submit because my authority, their authority is not unlimited. Can't just say, well, I'm your husband and, I, and, and you're supposed to do that. Well, no, 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 no. What did God say? Parents, you can't just slap your children around and and, and tell them to do stupid stuff because you got a pride issue. Amen. No. No, that your, your authority is, is limited by the will of God. Thank God for his will. Now, wives, submit to your own husband. It's interesting that in, in these verses, in 25 through 33, 12 verses, three of them are for the wife. Nine of them are for the husband. <laughs> that ought to tell you something about what Paul is talking about here. Okay? So let's read the women, the, the wives, three. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, 
so also the wives are to be to their husbands in everything. Done. All right. <laughs> husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and did what? Gave himself up for her. Mm, 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 mm. Do you remember? Go back to chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 1 and 2. And, and let's look at 2. Well, no, you've got to really look at 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God. And he's, this is Paul talking to all of the saints. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. If you remember either last week or the week before, this gave himself up is Christ being innocent gave himself over to the authorities for the guilty people. So the word there, the phrase there has the sense that I know I'm guilty. And, and you know how people uh, will, will commit a crime and they'll send the police out for them and they can't find them. But then you hear on the news report, the guilty person turned themselves in over to the authority to be punished. Well, that's what this word here means. But instead, Christ, the innocent one, turned himself over for the guilty to be punished for the guilty. So take that picture to this for the husband. And it says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. What does that mean, literally, in day-to-day -day application? It means no matter what my wife does, whether I think she's wrong or not, I'm giving myself up for her in love. So you, husbands, you can't say, well, but she did that. No, it doesn't matter. Well, but, but she burned the roast. I don't care. Your love covers everything that your wife does or, or you think she does or doesn't do. Gave himself up for her, loves her. He goes on in verse 26 and 27 to say that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself, present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. This, these two verses here, want, Paul wants the husband to understand that our love, our lives, our interactions with our wives should purify and protect them, should set them aside as special, should Treat, Christ treats us as saints. He has set us aside for himself. If, if your wife is not special to you, then you are out of the will of God. If you are not living to protect her, to cover her, to purify her, then man, you are out of God's will out of his will. The word there um, in verse 26 says washing of water with the word. The word there, the Greek word there for word is rhema, meaning to speak. So men, we, we ought to be speaking the word of God to our wives, into their lives, so that the word is, is what is used to sanctify them, to, to set them aside. You see, some of us want to set them aside in our own way, 
in, in our own thinking and, and which tends to be worldly and, and, and out of order. But the word of God. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we got to know the word of God. You see, I can't be a husband the way God wants me to be a husband and not know the word of God. If I don't know the word, I can't do it. It's like being wide earth, having two guns on his side and no bullets. You know, and nothing happens. You can't, you're not effective. But see, if I'm spending time in the word, which I ought to be, and it comes time to, to deliver, to protect, to purify, to sanctify, I'm giving the word of God. Paul goes on in verses 28 through 30. And essentially what Paul is saying here, if you put it in a nutshell, in fact, if, if you wanted to summarize everything that the man is supposed to do, it is summarized in love your wife the way Christ loved the church. That, that, you don't have to really go beyond that. But, but he gets a little bit specific. He breaks it down. He, he, he peels away the onion for us. The next thing he says here is to nourish and cherish her like it's your own body. <laughs> now, most men love themselves. They, they love their bodies. Now, some of us, you know, we don't treat our bodies very well. We, we eat the wrong things. We don't exercise. And, but we love ourselves in spite of all of that. So Paul is saying here, husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife is loving himself. So when you love your wife, you love yourself. That's the way you got to see it. It, it. It's interesting here that the words nourish and cherish are, are important words. The nourish there is the word uh, for building up, providing for growth so that I am built up to maturity. So it's like I'm... I'm eating my vegetables and my fruit on the way over here. We were hearing this, this um, doctor on the, on the radio talking about blueberries and how powerful blueberries are as antioxidants. He says, eat all the blueberries you want, especially if you're over the age of 70. Because there were tests done that showed that the more blueberries you eat, the more blueberry juice you get, it strengthens your mind for memory and learning. So. If I'm a man, I'm going to blueberry my wife. I'm going to nourish her so that she, she thinks better. I'm going to nourish her so that she looks good. I'm going to nourish her so that she, she grows to maturity in the Lord. Why? Because we are one. We are one. God made us one. He put us in. He put us in the same body. He, he sees us as one. There is no other relationship on earth that exemplifies the Godhead like the union of man and woman. None other. We, we are the picture of God, the Godhead, oneness in unity. And so when, when, when I'm loving myself, I'm loving my wife. If I'm treating myself bad, then I'm treating her bad. There was a story, and then I'll end, about oneness. Dr. Henry Brandt, in his book, The Struggle for Peace, told the story of this woman who had a fear of going into supermarkets. And, and he dug kind of deep into what was going on in, in her heart. And he says, well, who are you angry with? And, and so she played back, played back. Well, you know, I'm angry with my husband because of this one situation, and guess where it happened? In a supermarket. And so this thing that happened between her and her husband was so emotionally 
uh, hurtful in a supermarket that she carried this fear of supermarkets in her heart until that moment he helped her understand you gotta love him that's how oneness we are see when when I do stuff to myself I'm impacting my wife and vice versa we are one people even say we start to look alike and that's a good thing for me because she's beautiful oneness Now, the one thing that we got to understand, look at verse 33, and then I'll close. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. As you read that verse, you don't see any conditions. It doesn't say... Let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, after she respects me. No, it doesn't say that. It also doesn't say, let the wife see to it that she respect her husband after he loves me. It doesn't say that. So I got to believe that I'm supposed to love my wife as myself, regardless of what she does no matter what wives you are to respect your husband if he doesn't love you respect him anyhow because ultimately when you read these verses look at um, verse 22 wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord you see you're not respecting him you're not submitting to him because of him you're submitting to him because of who's behind him see when I look when you look at your husband you got to look through him and see Jesus <laughs> and 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 if you see Jesus then you can respect him you can submit to him you can give him everything that he needs to build him up doesn't matter how he loves you or whether he loves you or not husbands Love your wives. She can be the most wonderful wife in the world. And quite frankly, because there are so many divorces, she can be the worst wife in the world. But if you are a believer, you love her as Christ loved her. Because he loved us, even at our worst, he loved us. It's not about us. Submission is about Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you so much. Jesus, we thank you because you submitted yourself unto your Father that you would give yourself as a sacrifice to save us. You gave yourself up for us. You loved us, redeemed us, poured out your own blood. In fact, Lord, someday, sometime today, we must make a transformation we must have a transformation in our hearts and our minds about how we think about you how we live our lives to please you to submit to one another to love you